Tribe Environmental Department. We, along with the GJAC Foundation and the Cultural Heritage Department, do wild rice conservation and restoration efforts for the Gun Lake Tribe. And as part of the education that we do, um, we produced a Minoman video that I, or documentary that I am going to share with you today. And then in the order of time, I might have time for questions, but I'm happy to talk with people after the session. Um, and hopefully this works. Do you have your sound hooked up? Um, route began in the east. Uh, we believe it started at the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, it's a very sacred area for us and if you go go there, there's a very sacred place that are kept by the Wabanaki Indians. That there is a, a sacred place where fresh water flows with the salt and that we believe that that was our origin of, of our being. Uh, there are seven main clans that we follow as Anishinaabe. And our creation story actually tells us that those uh, seven grandfathers, we, we, they we were referred to as prophets, and they told prophecies to our people. And one of those prophecies involved following our migration route to the place where food grows on water. And when we came to the Great Lakes region, we found that food that grows on water, which is Minoman, the wild rice. Well, the wild rice is, is who we are. Wild rice is the reason that we as Anishinaabe people migrated here from the East Coast. Without any land, without any reservation status, without, without anything, without any means to sustain ourselves. We always relied on hunting, trapping, fishing, and of course, wild rice. The Minoman is one of our four sacred foods that we use in ceremony. And Minoman is primarily a spirit food that ensures a healthy spirit. I mean, there's, there's certain things that we have. We have fish, we have hunted meat, we have strawberries, corns, beans, and squash. And we have the wild rice at all of our ceremonies. You know, those are our sacred foods that we have to have there. There's certain ceremonies uh, that we do where rice has to be prominent, a prominent dish, and one of those is our burials. When we, when we bury and when we celebrate somebody's life, we uh, have a feast, a 
four day fire and, and rice rice is a part of that that feast. When we get there, the first thing that we did was pray. The first thing that we did was go to the water and we would put our tobacco in the water and we would ask for, you know, us, uh, us you know, thanks for being there. Um, thanks for uh, the opportunity, you know, and keeping us safe and, and letting us return. Um, that we're telling, you know, the rice that we're, that we're going to um, harvest it and that we're going to reseed it. You know, I believe it was 75% of what we harvested was reseeded. I guess when you first set out in the canoe, you have to like go find the rice bed. It's not gonna be like right there. It could be at the other end of the lake from the dock. So you're like paddling out and the rice bed was at the other end of the lake. And so when we got there, uh, you have to kind of like get into the rice bed. So there's rice on either side of your canoe. And then there would be two of us in a canoe the person that would be up front would be sitting in the canoe backwards. The person in the back would be the one with the, the push pole. In order to get around in the rice bed, you can't like paddle through it. You have to use a push pole. It has these two prongs at the end, and then you push it into the mud, like maybe onto the roots of the plant. And so you're just kind of pushing yourself along in the boat. And so if you use paddles, like you're gonna damage the rice plants. So if you use um, a push pole, which is um, Gad Keegan in Potawatomi. So you're using the push pole to navigate and you can like do these turns and stuff. And I think I like push pulling better. It's cause you, you can stand up. And so you're, you can see above the rice plants. Whereas if you were sitting down doing the knocking, you're kind of just kind of in it which is cool too, but I like to see over the rice plants. You know, you could look out and you could see the rice and you could see thicker stuff and then you could see thinner stuff, you know. As you would select an area to go through, you would like, so, you know, you'd have a section that would be maybe an acre big and you would just crisscross right back through it. You would just, you'd have lines that would go through probably six feet apart and you can see right where you went through because there would be a trail and then you would be six foot over and you would come back and you'd be six over and you'd come back and you would try to do it that way and then you would go the other way with it. Six feet back and that's about as far out as you can reach is like three feet over this way. When you're coming back over you can reach out about three feet coming back that way. So then there would be the person that would be up front and they would be backwards and they would have what we call the knockers. And then these right here are our knockers. Um, these are a little lot of cedar and they're uh, a light wood like that. The knockers are Boa Eganaknen in Potawatomi. But um, so you're using your knockers to like sort of bring the rice plants over the canoe and then you kind of knock them together. And just the slight, the slight tap and knocks the good rice that's ripe into the boat. Hit the knocker, which would jolt the, the rice stalk, and then the ripe rice that would be on the stalk there would fall into the canoe. Some of it would fall out of the canoe. So as we're going, so now mind you, the person in the front is going backwards, so they can't see where you're going, but all this rice is around them, and so they're just reaching and, you know, and they're trying to get the rice into the canoe and knocking it into the canoe. It sounds like it's raining inside the boat. I don't know if you've heard that at all today, um, but when, you, when you're going back and you're like almost backstroking and you're tapping at rice and you hear the rice falling into the boat, it sounds like it's raining. You know, then, then you would get back with your rice and you got your canoe and you get back on the shore, then you'd have a great big tarp set up and you'd pull the canoe, set it on top of the tarp, and you're, and you're real careful and you get all the rice out, you sweep it all out, flip it over, and you, you, know, you get it in the tarp and then you just kind of fold up the tarp and gather it in the middle there and, and gather it up in the gunny sacks. So when you go on and get wild rice, you know, a lot of people say, well, how much rice do you get? I mean, I tell people my goal is to get about 1,300 to 1,500 pounds a year just for for my needs um, uh, at home, which are for uh, for the elders, for uh, 
the uh, ceremonies for feasts, for the day when ceremonies that I attend. Um, I, I, have, I have that amount, but when I say that amount, when you actually do this process, you only get about 50%, and if you're really lucky, you get about a 50% total yield from your, from your green harvest. Uh, it still doesn't be in my mind and I'm biased because I do this. Uh, I really want to protect this, but um, this wild rice grows in a natural environment. You know, we harvest it the traditional way. We have to be respected and we, we process it the traditional way. Um, and we put our love into it. Um, I think that's, that's some of those things that are absent. So once we bring it back, you have to dry it out for a few days and let the all the moisture pretty much get out of the rice and then you're gonna parch it so you need like a fire and then like a kettle that'll be 45 degrees over the fire but not like the very top of it will be over the fire and then you use your um, the parching paddle to push the rice over into the hot part of the kettle so it'll be like really hot and then it cools down and really hot and then it cools down so it won't burn completely it'll just kind of make the hole really brittle and this is the parching paddle it's gapizage wabwins so you're using your gapizage wabwins to just push like a couple handfuls of rice and then once it's brittle enough you're gonna dance or jig it and it's like in this pit that you have like a canvas tarp over, a pit that's kind of dug in the ground. You take those couple handfuls of rice and you'll put it in the pit and you have your um, bawashka moccasin. So it's your jigging moccasins. So the rice is really sticky. So if you try to do it in like your socks, it'll just stick to you. You're not gonna do anything. And then like regular shoes would just kind of crush it and make it like powder. But um, if you have your rising moccasins, then it will just kind of rub the, the brittle hole off. The hole will be separated, but then you have like this mess of rice and then holes. So you have to winnow it. And then you take your winnowing dish, noshkajigin, and you just have the, the rice in there and then you kind of drop it a little bit and you let the the lighter material of the holes will kind of float out. And the rest is just sorting. Well, it's it's like your macaroni and cheese. It's it's something it's your soul food. It's your spirit food, it's your nourishment, it's your favorite food in the whole world. To us as Nishnabe people, we just have an a affinity for it. Fortunately, a lot of our younger Nishnabe people are innovative and they're creating new ways to present and cook. Wild rice is an, as an importance in the, in the culture, I mean, is because the native people would be ricing for so many days out of the year and you know they they would devote their life to getting that rice so it was i mean it would be part of an everyday thing you know you'd wake up you'd eat blueberry rice and you know go to bed you'd have wild rice soup some of the, some of the favorite dishes that people would make with wild rice uh and it'd be an acorn stuffed wild rice uh which would which primarily would have uh a dried fruit or a fresh fruit into it, some nuts and a little bit of maple sugar and then you stuff that inside of that and uh, pretty much bake the whole thing so all of all of the rice seeps into the acorn and it all marries together and then uh, also you know people would make uh, a blueberry rice uh, just be regular cooked wild rice and some fresh blueberries a little bit of maple sugar and maple syrup in there what we're doing more or less in the modern stance is taking uh, wild rice and incorporating it into things like a, a bread pudding, uh, just adding it right to the custard and it takes on that nice earthy flavors that you get and marrying it also with like a, a squash bread. Per personally, it's a, it's like a carrying on a tradition, you know, being able to 
cook rice that we've harvested and you know kind of showing that you know native people are still here you know we're we're still doing the things our ancestors did and we're we're not only cooking the way that our ancestors did but we're also going that extra mile to make sure that our culinary mark is left you know and that i mean really what you know cooking those traditional dishes that's what it means to me is that i'm leaving a culinary mark in my community wild rice is an important resource in the great lakes basin in the coastal and interior wetlands and water bodies it provides cover and habitat food sources for migrating waterfowl it creates nursery habitat for fishes and it um, also obviously provides a good food resource for people a lot of things i encountered here are no longer here i'm having a hard time finding morel mushrooms um, trilliums used to be here in abundance um, even the may apples are are, are not as, as plentiful as they were and i know our environmental department is, is compiling a climate change document for the tribe and that's some of the things that that we as traditional people will note you know these things are are disappearing you know when i was little i could go into a field and it would be full of butterflies of every color and now you just see you know a monarch or two here or there and we as a Anishinaabe people, we, we do pray for those beings because we know they're all part, they're pollinators, um, they're carriers, they're messengers. So the big problem that exists is rice disappearing. So there's concentrations of rice where there are decent amounts of rice um, and we're trying to take that little rice that we have left, which is a very small percentage of what used to be here, and try to get it back where it used to be. When we look at it, we're looking at something that we're bringing back. Um, it'll bring back more wildlife, more people connected to that water to harvest that rice. We were we worry about you know we were worried about rice. We also worry about the black ash tree, but we put uh, our, we pray for them and. And like I told you, they're alive. And they, they can commute with our Creator just like we can. And our Creator knows. He always answers our prayer. He knows what to do. And I know that He'll take care of the rice. If, you know, it won't be completely destroyed. It'll be taken care of. Because the rice is there. To, they, they talk to our Creator too, just like these trees out here or anything that out here. We believe that they're alive and that they're part of creation. And the Creator, the Creator is not going to forget about them. He's not going to let them disappear because they're part of our life. That rice is part of our life. Our Botawatimi Minoman project, our goal is to assess the current and historical rice beds in the Kalamazoo River watershed with specific focus on Gun Lake Tribe's historical area. So we are trying to focus on areas around here that the tribe might have actually been ricing or looking for restoration spots where the tribe would actually rice in the many generations when the rice is thick enough after restoration. So our project is to assess, to map, and then to actually restore. In Gun Lake, which is a local lake in the Kalamazoo River watershed, our historical documents show that in the 1980s there was 40 acres or more of wild rice and then by the 2000s it was down to just a couple acres and now there's no rice in Gun Lake and that's due to many things including water level manipulations because of controlling the water level in the lake for recreation as well as the recreational activity because boaters don't like wild rice so there's lots of things that contribute to the decline. So another thing they don't realize is how important that resource is to the area. There are our tribe from Gun Lake, another tribe from Mount Pleasant, um, some tribes from the Northwest Lower Peninsula, and even some tribes from the Upper Peninsula have talked about going to Talos Lake to rice and actually harvest rice because it is so scarce everywhere else around the state that they don't realize what importance that resource is in Talos Lake. They just see it as a hindrance on them personally for whatever activity they want to do recreationally on the lake. 
it really shows how important it is when you can draw people from all around the state just for that one resource. It's a, it's a long trip just to try to reseed in your area, um, which is what we did. Um, went all the way to Taos with all our resources, spent money on hotels and gas and time for people working there just to bring what little rice we could back to our area to try to get some little morsel of a wild rice bed in our area. The culture of ricing in the Gun Lake Tribe is nearly lost. As we've gone through this project, we've found that there are not that many cultural resources to turn to to guide us in the project. And that's because the wild rice is declining and declined to such a level that there aren't that many people in the tribe that do this with their families because it's their grandparents or their great grandparents that do it. And that's because it's not around here anymore. The main thing that people always think about with wild rice is consumption. It, uh, rice is really high in protein, so it is sought after by a lot of different uh, wildlife and also humans. It's one of the major components of waterfowl diet, mainly because the rice matures at the same time that their migration happens in the fall time. So the Great Lakes is a really big area for wild rice, for ducks to come down. They kind of stage around Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, because there's so much rice there for them to eat and uh, it's so plentiful. It uh, helps them build their fat reserves for their giant migration down south. Another thing that people don't realize is fish use wild rice um, pretty extensively. It's a great nursery habitat for small fish um, for protection, but on the other hand, there's also like lion weight predators like northern pike that use wild rice because they can hide in the rice and wait for fish to come by and then that's when they attack. Um, like I said before, with also with insects, small fish, um, little invertebrates, um, you name it, it's in the rice. You're not only taking rice seed from the rice plant, you're taking part of that lake. Um, and another thing is the best way to reseed rice or the best thing to do with a rice bed is to rice it because as you're ricing, you're not getting all the rice that you're taking from that plant. When you bend over rice and knock it into your canoe, you're also spreading rice off knocking rice off that plant into the water and it's help rejuvenating that rice bed. So it's not always a take, you're actually giving and taking, you're helping the rice bed as you're taking all the rice. Well, we are losing the spirit for one thing. Once it's genetically modified, um, or once it's taken in the genome sequence that they wanna do for the rice, uh, they're essentially destroying the spirit of that rice. So that would be my most important message is um, let wild rice stay wild. Stop the, um, the, the splicing of the genes of the wild rice with other rice. Because once that happens, we are gonna lose it forever. So that would be my most important message is, is let wild rice be wild. Not all of the dominant society is ignorant to the fact that we're Indians and we're wanting to save this for our own spiritual nourishment, but they'll realize it's worth saving as well just because it's one of the truly indigenous foods. We're not going to ask for the whole lake to be abolished of speedboats and toys. It's just the areas where the wild rice has historically always been. We are working really hard to bring back the culture, the traditions, the language. Our tribe is a very young tribe. 75% are under the age of 25. So we have a lot of young people coming up and I just think it's wonderful that the environmental department along with our culture and language department are able to collaborate and work together my, um, myself, along with the elders, are very excited about all the teachings that are coming back. Being able to watch the younger generation start this process and to come through is, is just a magical journey. It is a part of my job as an Anishinaabe Kwe to continue this work and to hand it down to the next generation. Maybe someday my great-grandchildren will be going and doing the same type of work, handing down these traditions to our family and to our children because we want to ensure that um, our traditions are carried on, you know, for the next seven generations. So I do feel blessed that this has fallen into my lap, so to speak, as far as 
ricing and learning about it and given the opportunity to learn about wild rice because it was a part of our history. It's a part of our, um, of who we are. So I feel like that's my, that's my life work to, to continue to keep learning. Our grand chief had a dream four times he had it. What about our young people? The dream was telling him, asking him, what about our young people? He couldn't understand what our creator was asking him about. And the young people, what about them? And it finally came to him that, what about our young people who come to our lodge who do not speak the language? And they come and go as young people from four different directions, miles, a thousand miles away they come. They come for it because they were driven there, their, their hearts brought them there, their spirit brought them there. Because they want to look there, they want to look. A lot of them are from uh, adopted homes, never knew an English Indian person in their lives. But they come to the lodge and want to find out who they are, where they come from. Because if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. Questions before we go to our next speaker? Okay. Well, do you have any um, questions about our restoration and conservation project? Um, most of the environmental department staff is here around today. And we do, um, I do want to call out thanks to Roger Levine. He's been our um, cultural guide throughout the program with everything from culture and safety and how to do things the right way. So thank you, Roger. Distributing the videos? Um, the video is actually um, available at um, on YouTube, and I believe there's a link to it um, off of the gjack.org website. 